Well, good morning, everybody. Excuse me. Uh, and it's, it's nice to see you all again. Um, and, uh, since I'm first out of the gate, uh, in the interest of, of moving quickly, I won't uh, uh, delay but jump right in. I'm going to begin with just a brief uh, overview summary of, of what I think are perhaps the key or at any rate the most kind of interesting uh, findings and ideas that have come out of my project thus far. And then more importantly, uh, towards the end of my uh, presentation, I'd like to focus on the larger implications and issues for further discussion about you know, potentially broader questions that might arise as we discuss wisdom. Uh, so just to recap, I, I, I want to begin with the observation that uh, as sometimes happens as you go into these projects, uh, what you expect to find isn't what you find. And the four main figures who constitute the, the real pillars of my project turn out to be hopelessly unwise pretty much for the entire duration of their, their trajectories. And so that's kind of necessitated a slight uh, change on my title, uh, even though Microsoft Word doesn't like the word unwisdom. That really better summarizes what I'm, I'm really focusing on here. Um, in particular, they're unwise in the extremes of attitude and action to which they uh, resort throughout their careers. And uh, this is all something that uh, you may remember from last year I uh, talked about briefly at the end of my presentation. Uh, I suggest that you could map two different pairs of my four major characters uh, onto two different grids. The first one being the most obvious one since these are two characters who seem to struggle and fail to resolve the tension specifically of self versus community in very different ways. On the one hand, on the left, we have here Achilles who's a perfect example of somebody who basically throughout the Iliad lives entirely for himself and acts solely on what he sees to be important to him. And only gradually does he uh, begin to cultivate an awareness of the needs and uh, uh, points of view of others. So per potentially moving along this, this arrow, but for the most part, uh, he's stuck way over here in the extreme. And I offer as a contrast Aeneas in the uh, Aeneid who's entirely the opposite. He lives solely for others and uh, in the process self-abnegates himself uh, to the point where it generates intolerable strains on his character. Just to give you a sense that these are not necessarily uh, uh, the only ways in which Greco-Roman poetry offer examples of people who negotiate these tensions, I've also added complementary figures for each one. Uh, Odysseus in the Odyssey for Achilles, for example. Sorry, my pointer is sort of losing power. Um, who does a much better job of balancing what he needs for himself with what his uh, people around him need. And he manages uh, surprisingly well to negotiate both of those throughout. Uh, as another example, oh, thanks very much. As another example, then, Caesar for Aeneas, uh, in his own narrative of the Gallic Wars and the Civil Wars, again, manages to contrive the circumstances and the understanding of them in such a way that what is good for Rome who knew would be good for Caesar as well. And so his own self-interest is advanced even as he seems to be looking out for his soldiers, for his uh, uh, party, if you will, and for the nation of Rome as a whole. So this is to suggest that it doesn't have to be an either or choice in the ancient world, that there are other contrary examples of people who manage this balance. The other pair, though, that is an Oedipus in the Oedipus uh, Rex and Catullus in his own poetry, don't quite fit onto this self versus community axis quite so well because both of them uh, manifest uh, elements of self-concern and concern for their wider community throughout. But they're very different people. And so I work to identify some other dimension on which they could be contrasted. And that's really a question of engagement. Uh, Oedipus in Thebes is deeply engaged in the public life of his community. That basically defines him, his conception of himself as a ruler. Uh, and how he has to respond to his people is everything to him. Catullus, by contrast, looks at the corruption and moral decay that surrounds him in Rome, and he says, well, to hell with it. I'm just going to drop out and hang around with my artistic friends. Uh, and so you have a big contrast of engagement versus disengagement between the two of them. They, too, have contrasts of uh, models of people who seem to manage this balance of public versus uh, uh, private more successfully. Um, that's Oedipus, Colonus, Cicero, and Atticus. So since we have two axes, I've combined the two. I suggest that you can combine the two into a kind of a grid, which generates interesting connections or interesting possibilities. I've outlined possible types that could occupy these grids in each of the sections. Uh, an engaged, community-oriented person would be an activist. Disengaged would be a theorist. Disengaged and selfish, you get a narcissist who doesn't need anybody else. And, and engaged and selfish, you get an egotist somebody who needs to exploit other people in order to get what he needs. 
Uh, these are only sample types, I, ha I hasten to, to point out. I'm not suggesting that these are the only types in this grid, but these are types that occupy these areas. And this can actually be mapped onto particular classes of people or professions rather interestingly. This works quite well for politicians, by the way, uh, uh, as different types and what seems to motivate them. So really quickly then, as far as the implications, broader implications are concerned, uh, one is that movement is possible in this grid based on changing experiences or uh, 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 circumstances. The second is that the danger of unwisdom seems to lie out at the extremes of this grid. If you are too engaged or disengaged, too selfish or too community oriented, that leads to disaster. Thirdly, that implies that wisdom may lie in the center of this grid some sort of moderation or balance. But if so, what trait or act is required to achieve this occupation of the center? Empathy is one possibility, an ability to you know, look into the minds of others and see what they're feeling. But even more interesting, I think, is the possibility that what is required to occupy the center is mindfulness, an awareness of what your interests are, an awareness of what you are doing to pursue those interests. My unwise men at the extremes never exhibit that. Uh, the ones in the center seem to exhibit it to a greater degree. So I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe uh, there's promising ground to be broken in that direction. Thanks very much.